excited about the fact that we are actually being recorded now by two programs because uh, it has been my experience with at least one of the programs kind of <laughs> that mm -mm, not for me, not this evening. So, uh, as I said, we have a very special guest here with us uh, tonight. Uh, his name is Danny Bluestein. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, about, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago or a month ago, three weeks ago, um, I was reading a, an article at the Israeli uh, newspaper called Haaretz, the land, and, or the country, whatever. And uh, it was a very, very interesting article about uh, kind of the funny guy who thought that uh, jet plane engines might have something to do with the human heart. And I was talking to my girlfriend, Nira, and I said, uh, look at this. This sounds very, very interesting. And she looked at the name and she said, wow, this is Danny Bluestein. We used to go to the same school. So uh, not only that, but uh, Danny was kind enough to uh, invite all his friends from, I don't know uh, if it was only from Israel, but anyhow, uh, we found uh, an email from Danny thanks to Nira inviting her to uh, to read the article. So obviously I jumped in, uh, jumped up about, uh, I think, it was close to seven feet, and uh, grabbed the email and uh, just dropped an email to Danny, and uh, that was the beginning of this love story. Uh, so, welcome to you, Danny. And uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so it's very nice introduction. Tell us a little bit. What was a jet plane has to do with our own little thumb. Well, uh, it's uh, indirectly, but uh, in uh, my kind of uh, thinking process, I always like to connect uh, things that uh, do not uh, seem to be affiliated. Uh, because uh, if you may recall from our communications, I look at things that uh, kind of a spectrum. Now, when we come up with uh, any type of uh, solution, uh, even uh, for a clinical problem like uh, heart failure or something like that, we do not always imitate what uh, nature does. Sometimes uh, we need to imitate the function, uh, but not necessarily the way it was uh, created uh, by uh, billions of years of evolution. So uh, when we come to uh, kind of help a failing heart, uh, with uh, specifically the uh, example that you bring, which is uh, kind of similar to miniature uh, jet engine, we're looking at uh, propelling blood, and uh, to do that uh, we want to achieve the function of uh, helping the heart that is uh, poorly pumping which is uh, basically the uh, disease that is called congestive heart failure. Now, those patients, uh, uh, until uh, recent years, if there wasn't uh, heart transplantation uh, available for them, or uh, if they are eligible at all to receive such a heart uh, transplant, they would eventually die because of this uh, congestive heart failure. So what we would like to come up is with uh, devices that uh, may help this uh, ailing heart. And uh, uh, along the way, there were like uh, many types of uh, solutions. And uh, one of the solutions, and this uh, one that uh, I was uh, working with, uh, with this uh, company, Micromed, uh, based in Houston, Texas, uh, was, and uh, they're not the first to do that. Uh, and they actually started with a very famous heart surgeon called the, the Bakey. And this was the initial uh, the Becky device, and in a way uh, it does resemble uh, this miniature jet engine. Uh, but it's only functioning the same way that the jet engine in uh, airplane is uh, providing thrust in order to uh, 
should the airplane follow, uh, the idea is to uh, help the ailing heart to pump out uh, the blood with enough uh, blood supply to the rest of the body, what's called the cardiac output. But uh, this is uh, totally, uh, I would say, abnormal to pathological uh, type of blood flow conditions as compared uh, to what we see in the normal pumping heart. And uh, that, of course, uh, created many, many problems. And one of the major problems is the generation of the blood clots. Uh, uh, this is uh, basically uh, small particles uh, that are flying around the body, a uh, cloud of those uh, particles, and uh, if we go to the brain, for example, uh, to our carotid arteries, uh, to the neck, and then uh, uh, if uh, finally in the brain, then uh, we may induce uh, what's called the cardioembolic stroke that may either disable uh, uh, the person or even uh, kill them. Now, the uh, solution for that was to give uh, anticoagulants, uh, which are very powerful drugs with uh, many, many problems. And the question is, uh, how can you kind of optimize the performance of such a pump that is completely different from the natural pumping heart in such a way that it won't create this uh, blood damage? So I don't want to go too technical into that. But uh, basically, it's borrowing some ideas from uh, aeronautical engineering, but it's not uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one per one kind of uh, correspondence. Uh, the problem is much more involved when we deal with the human body. We're kind of complex human beings. <laughs> but I think that uh, it's better that I stop with being that uh, technical, but uh, just uh, skimming through the surface. Here. Yeah, I was starting to uh, feel my arms kind of raise up and grab for things that were starting to uh, fly higher and higher over my head. Uh, but while you were talking about this, a lot of things came to my mind. Um, for example, I remember I read, you know, struck young. Uh, a very interesting book by Herbert Mead, the anthropo uh, anthropologist, and uh, he, uh, one sentence stayed with me for a long time and still stays, does stay with me. The human body uh, was actually built for top performance up to the age of 30, max 35. Beyond that, everything is up to chance. Uh, in other words, our teeth are not built to carry on working. Our mind becomes flooded more and more. And obviously, with time and the help of uh, science and uh, all the health specialists, by the way, one of the terrible uh, misdemeanors uh, that I know is calling a place the house of the ill, like they say in, in Hebrew, they say Bet Cholim. Why would you like to stay in a place where everybody else is ill? Why don't you want to go to a place where they are there to heal you and not to keep you ill? But anyhow, this is another. Uh, but what, what I'm trying to get to, are we smart to try to outsmart our heritage? Are we smart to try to live longer? Wouldn't it be better to try to make the best we can out of the 35 years we have? I'm talking about the body. I'm talking about everything that's really, well, as somebody who is getting closer and closer to 35, I start feeling that more and more of the little systems uh, kind of wake up in the morning and say, hey, Dan, remember, I used to be here. I'm gone. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, the role of the dice and uh, whether God is or is not playing dice, but how important and how dangerous is it to interfere with something so complex and so complicated as the human environment? I'm not going to say the human body or the human being, the human environment, whatever we want to be on. Okay, I would love to... Uh, 
respond to that. Uh, now, of course, uh, we now uh, that we need to the philosophy, uh, philosophical and philosophical aspect of that. But I think that uh, we uh, I'm trying to bring you back to my field. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and that's fine with me. Uh, we're competing uh, with evolution. Uh, evolution, uh, like uh, Richard Dawkins uh, said, it's like the blind uh, watchmaker. Evolution has uh, one purpose, uh, to spread the genes uh, in any type of uh, life form. Uh, uh, evolution is blind uh, to us. Uh, evolution couldn't tell less if we exist or not. We as uh, human beings, uh, with uh, a kind of uh, accelerated the development of the brain, uh, which of course makes uh, childbirth uh, so difficult uh, uh, for us, uh, we uh, outsmart our bodies. There's uh, no question about it, uh, but in many ways, uh, you know, I just uh, read, uh, heard on the uh, National Public Radio over here the other day. The discussion uh, of uh, um, neuroscientists uh, about the fact that uh, it's now pretty clear that uh, with uh, brain plasticity, as we get uh, older and older, we do not necessarily, you know, we had this notion okay, neurons are dying, uh, uh, brain uh, is going through atrophy, uh, we're losing brain cells, uh, we should become uh, much more stupid as we age. But is it uh, really the case? Uh, I don't know. I'm uh, not uh, very objective about it, but I don't feel this way. Now, okay, so we have this uh, brain that uh, may get better, may get worse. It's uh, a question to debate uh, upon. Uh, but uh, we have a machine around it, and uh, the body is a machine, a uh, very complex machine, but it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that uh, we don't have means to deal with the malfunctions of the machine. And uh, I have uh, no question uh, in my mind, because I uh, basically, as a non-believer, uh, don't have any problem interfering with anything that is supposed to be created uh, per se. Uh, so that if the body around us uh, have a problem, so that uh, I'm not really going for our maker to ask for, hey, I have a warranty, I need an extension here. Uh, I'm not going to pray for that. I'm going to try to repair it. So uh, that's uh, my attitude towards uh, the problem. So how dare we? Oh, uh, as long as uh, we live and we breathe and we have a solution, so we're going to do it anyways. And uh, even the believers will join in. Yeah, well, I'm, I... I was leaving uh, the good old man with the long white beard out of the picture for a second. Uh, which brings to my mind two stories. One, uh, I was really blessed by the possibility to uh, learn to know Professor Leibovitz. Uh, when he was obviously, after having lost, trillions and trillions of uh, brain cells, because when I met him, he was in his late 60s. Uh, he was a complete goner. And uh, as everybody knows, the guy was as brilliant as, uh, as a baby. Uh, but we, we used to have those, not polemic conversation, but something that started off with a question when I asked him, uh, how come that somebody like you can believe that there is a God, can believe that God is somebody with a long white beard who sits up there, and the only thing that he has to worry about is whether you eat milk with uh, your meat, and uh, whether you go around with, the, with your hat cap or something like that, and he said, just a minute, just a minute. If in the Jewish religion, there would have been a detto that says a good Jew every morning jumps up on the table and starts saying, I would do it. I am not here to ask questions. And this was a guy who asked questions about everything else in the world. But that's only one of the stories. The other story came with what you said about you not feeling that you are getting stupider and stupider. And I'd like to bring to our... Uh, collective memory, an incredible 
a fantastic story by uh, Borges, uh, the Argentinian uh, guy who, <laughs> on one hand, on one hand, used to say that uh, nobody should own more than two thousand books. And when the guy was losing his eyesight, which he started lo losing quite early, and uh, uh, he used to sell time to people who wanted to interview him because he was very, very knowledgeable and very uh, erudite. And he said, uh, I'm going to give an hour of an interview to everybody who would read three chapters of books that I would ask him to read to me. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking here about the story. He wrote a story about this young guy in uh, New York, in Central Park in New York, who sits on a bench uh, with his head between his hands, and he's crying. And there's this old gentleman that comes and sits next to him and says, uh, what's wrong? Is there anything I can uh, do to help you? And uh, the young guy, obviously, you know, uh, being in New York, uh, being young, and uh, he immediately thinks, what is this guy all about? What does he want from me? And slowly they come into a conversation, and uh, the older guy says, you're probably sure that this is the end, that you don't want to go on, and you don't want to do anything, and uh, and uh, the young guy says, yes, and I'm not like everybody else. I have the courage to be one with my decision. And the old man says, will you do me a favor? Put your hand into my pocket, into my trouser pocket, and uh, you'll find a note, a money note and take it out. And the young man thinks, you know, this guy is completely crazy. What is he? Uh, is he trying to bring me to his hotel room? But at the end, the old man says, okay, I'll do it. And he takes out a one dollar note from his pocket. And he asks the young guy, please, do you remember how many one dollar notes you had in your pocket and the guy said sure i do i only have two dollars left to my name said, so put your hand in your pocket and take out what I, the, the two dollars and show it to me and the young guy said well, but anyhow he wants to humor him so he takes out he only had one dollar note and the old man says you know why because i'm you I knew 65 years later, I did not do what I promised myself to do. I did not go and throw myself away and spent myself. And the only thing I kept from that one day is this one dollar note. And the other one dollar note I left to you. So we'll meet in another 50 years when you'll get to be the age I am, and maybe I'll get to be the age you are. Uh, the reason I'm telling this story is, first of all, because it's a fantastic uh, quasi Zen story told by uh, an elder Argentinian uh, writer. But it's about the, the fact what do we know about the way that Kronos is playing with us, the fantastic Greek god of time uh, who saw himself getting wasted away day after day after day. When is it that we as human beings start playing our own chronos? Okay, so I, if I may uh, budge in, so it, because you also mentioned, uh, of course, uh, Neighbor Beach, and uh, when I was young, I used to attend his uh, kind of shows, lectures in South Africa. And it, of course, I read a lot, uh, thank you. And uh, a couple of things. Uh, now, he had this kind of uh, uh, almost uh, illogical argument about his belief, because uh, he mentioned his belief that uh, basically he chose to believe. 
which is the, actually the only argument that uh, I can uh, more appreciate in a uh, believer. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, it kind of uh, makes uh, the existence or non existence of a God, which is uh, not necessarily an issue that I'm uh, very uh, concerned with, but uh, makes it uh, kind of a paradoxical. Because you choose to believe, uh, it's almost a meaning that you create uh, your own uh, God. Now, you also mentioned that you said that uh, you wouldn't question uh, anything uh, if you should uh, uh, go uh, uh, making chicken sounds uh, because it was thought so, or you wouldn't question that. And that uh, reminds me of this uh, uh, Tennyson uh, poem that I uh, quote in this, uh, 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 my rambling about the uh, atheism, that uh, verse not to reason why, verse but to do and die. So, it, it, in my opinion, it's a kind of uh, doomed uh, mission. Uh, yeah, you don't uh, question. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, we are all uh, doomed uh, to die, but uh, I am not looking at this uh, doomed. I'm uh, looking at it as uh, uh, the most uh, natural thing that uh, happens to any type of uh, uh, bio biology based uh, machinery, and it's uh, even uh, anything else in our universe. Now, you mentioned the uh, time, uh, the flavor of time, and uh, one of the, and I'm going back to uh, labor beat in a way, uh, one of his main arguments uh, was about uh, the problem, uh, he called it the psychophysical problem. Basically, that he, he can, as a scientist, and a very accomplished that he could explain anything about uh, how, for example, he moves up his arm like that and uh, all the neurons uh, firing in his uh, brain uh, leading uh, to the central nervous system and uh, doing the muscle contraction that eventually ends up uh, with this and maybe also clicking the fingers or whatnot. But he said that no one will be able to explain how is real uh, kind of uh, uh, generated the whole process or initiated it. Now, it took me years uh, to struggle with this, and uh, for me, it's not a problem anymore. He defined it as a problem, but uh, rather, first of all, uh, during the 20th century, we found out that uh, we could uh, say, uh, look at it as the decline or even uh, collapse of uh, causality. Now, uh, the kind of uh, rigorous uh, rational thinking of always uh, looking uh, for this uh, sequence uh, that uh, leads to a result, uh, because some extent it makes it uh, difficult to expect it. Now, once you accept that in a uh, world uh, many random processes then it is possible to initiate even very complex uh, processes and uh, even coordinate them together, starting with uh, random processes. We have more and more evidence of that. And in a way, uh, this acts uh, to counteract uh, this kind of uh, assumption of uh, causality. If you are willing to accept, uh, and uh, most of us uh, find it pretty uh, tough to accept, that uh, not everything that uh, we live uh, accordingly or exist upon uh, actually are initiated by uh, causality, but uh, rather maybe by random processes. And uh, I think that anyone who's uh, looking uh, in inside uh, in, on their own life. Uh, could attest to that, that uh, many random processes uh, eventually led us uh, to where we are uh, nowadays. Uh, so, if you're willing to accept that, and even uh, looking at your own uh, life experience, I see uh, no reason to always look for the kind of uh, typical uh, explanation you know, of uh, causality. So, uh, I may stop here, but uh, because it may open uh, kind of uh, points of the discussion. No, I think, uh, well, first of all, while you were talking, obviously a lot of things uh, started uh, streaming down my mind. 
I don't know who among the uh, friends that are here with us had the uh, joy of torture trying to read à la recherche de temps perdu, searching for lost time. Uh, I have a kind of a stupid illness. Once I open the book and I read the first sentences, I can't put the book away until I finish it. I can read more than one book at a time, but I cannot not finish a book. Uh, I should have finished reading uh, Proust after the first 600 pages, but I went on. But there's one sentence there uh, that came to my mind while you were talking. Uh, he talks there about we all grow up <clears throat> with the knowledge and the notion that we're going to die. You said it's a natural thing. Uh, what Proust, I find uh, very intelligently said, but we never actually expect it to be today. Uh, we never wake up in the morning and say, ah, I'm going to die today. Well, unless, you know, you're Primo Levi or whatever. Um, this is something that I think is an inbuilt defense mechanism that we probably inherited from for animals. Because, uh, well, you know, in my stupidity and humbleness, I want to think that my dog does not know that he's going to die. Uh, and uh, going by history, I have to think that I am probably going to die. But I don't really believe it. I don't wake up. I, I never remember one moment in my life when I woke up in the morning and I said, okay, today is going to be the day. Or today is going to be maybe the day. And um, uh, again, by the way, thank you for bringing Richard Dawkins into it, because I think really, if there's anyone who is a real teacher of, you know, the uselessness of trying to find a reason why we're here, it's probably Richard Dawkins with uh, the blind watchmaker and the blind gene. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's not only a pleasure, it's, it, it opens up so many horizons in a... Um, I wanted to to ask you something else. You also touched upon uh, causality. There's a fantastic. You know that there is a, a whole school of thought, uh, especially in the uh, ex-Soviet Union and the uh, Russian ex-Soviet Union. Uh, they had a whole university dedicated to the teaching of causality, because uh, they wanted to prove that there is such a thing as chance, that there is such a thing that is not dictated by God. And uh, they handed out, and there's a beautiful book by Robert Little, who is today the father of Jonathan Little, because his son won uh, the Dalimar. Something happened here. Anyhow, um, it's called the visiting professor. I don't know if you happen to read that book. No, I wasn't even aware of this uh, Russian school of thought. Uh, no, I wasn't even aware of this Russian Yeah, they they were the first one to go very deeply into starting to. Um, is there anything that can happen, not in a chain of incidences or coincidences but that can happen as a surprise and in yeah, well, I, I think from a lot of physics uh, the evidence is heard through quantum mechanics and uh, now, uh, all the new theories about uh, creation of the universe uh, but are not necessarily looking for a cause for it well I think that uh, one of the uh, one of the very few big occasions of the 20th and 21st century is that I think more and more human beings are getting accustomed to the idea that not everything has a cause, that not everything has a chain of events that lead to a cause. 
uh, well, maybe at least 5% of humanity is trying to get to understand and, and live with this. Uh, what does uh, a scientific mind do in order to regain its um, its vigor. It's uh, what do you do? Do you read more science books? Do you, what do you do in order to allow your mind to regenerate a new tomorrow? Well, uh, it's interesting because uh, I was thinking about it uh, the other day, and uh, I read a lot. Uh, I can't uh, go to sleep with, uh, without uh, reading for easily an hour, if not uh, longer. So uh, sometimes at the expense of uh, some sleeping hours. Now, I found out that uh, when I'm uh, very involved in uh, research, uh, kind of. Uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, goes into that, so I tend to uh, read much more fiction or listen to more music. And the other way around, uh, when uh, I'm not that uh, creative in my research and uh, uh, I'm uh, kind of uh, coasting uh, in words, uh, it always happens, uh, but, you know, it goes up and down. Then I tend to, to read more non-fiction. And this is, uh, has happened uh, any direct uh, connection to the, necessarily the type of research that I'm conducting here at that uh, moment, but uh, just in general. So there's always kind of a balance between the two, and probably one fits the other in a way that I may not be fully aware of. Um, in a, the a, a type of a regular scientific uh, way, sometimes uh, you need the gun pointed uh, to your head, a point blank, in order to uh, do the thinking. Uh, sometimes it uh, comes to you out of the blue. Uh, now, uh, and that's interesting because it may go back to the discussion about uh, the chain of uh, kind of uh, causes and. Uh, uh, results that uh, we usually are looking for, and I figured out that uh, the way that I understand things, I cannot uh, really pinpoint, but uh, there's always a kind of point that uh, looks like uh, what's called in uh, physics uh, the quantum leap, but suddenly you understand. Thing that you struggle with, and uh, you think, uh, oh, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't, and suddenly it does me. Now, uh, knowing a little bit uh, about uh, new models of how our brain uh, thinking process uh, occurs, uh, like neural networks uh, type of modeling, if you look at the kind of uh, analytical uh, type of uh, way of uh, analyzing that, it's not surprising that the uh, thinking uh, process and uh, understanding of this uh, goes not uh, linearly, not even non-linearly, but uh, actually in almost a uh, quantum leap type of uh, project. It's uh, like uh, the uh, convergence of enough uh, uh, critical mass that suddenly uh, make you understand things. At least this is my personal experience. So I don't have uh, necessarily an explanation to that, uh, but uh, going back uh, to that, yeah, so you, you may read a lot, try to understand things, and uh, you may not understand anything. Uh, and uh, then uh, suddenly, uh, without even thinking about it, uh, it dawns on you. So it's part of a creative uh, process, and this is why uh, I think that uh, in no way is it different from the creating music, writing, uh, poetry, fiction, uh, whatever, writing anything, expressing uh, what you're saying. Uh, it's uh, always uh, like that, and uh, I, I do see this from my personal experience, a lot of uh, feedback loops that uh, feed each other in the process. So I, I, it's not like, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to be now very rigorous, I'm going to uh, read the textbooks and try to understand this, right? the, the way we were taught to believe that uh, be 
the perfect A students, and uh, then we'll understand uh, everything. Uh, we understand nothing by this kind of work. How to teach to other people to uh, do this type of thinking, it's very tough. I'm uh, teaching all the time, and uh, you also teach, so in order to, in order to from your uh, own teaching process, you're probably familiar with that. You're trying uh, to probably provoke your students to come up with uh, their own thinking, and uh, but you have to first teach them the rules, of course. Uh, you cannot bypass uh, those. But uh, uh, some of them uh, will always uh, keep, it, no matter when you teach all of them the same, uh, will keep the technical process of might become proficient there, but uh, will not understand anything or will understand very little. Some of them uh, you find this kind of creative spark where suddenly they come up with a question that is say, uh, wow. That's interesting. But, uh, but from my experience, you don't see it too often, unfortunately. No, you are very right. <laughs> it brings to memory the first day that I taught university. I'm not talking about uh, anything else. The first day I taught university was at the Hyper University. It was a new university. Uh, nobody knew exactly what, which direction it was going to take. And uh, I was accepted to teach at the philosophy uh, faculty. And the first day, uh, I told the secretary to write that the uh, first lesson would be held in a, uh, a hall which was next to the courtyard. And so the Six students <laughs> came to my uh, course who were sitting in this uh, hall next to the courtyard and I stayed with a friend of mine to open the door for me and I rode into the classroom on a motorbike and I had a huge basket in front of me and I was going around with a, a Mexican hat on my head and grabbed pieces of paper from the basket, come and grab your notes, come and grab your notes. So everybody had the notes and the notes were rather high. And I said, okay, I stopped the bike, went off the bike and I said, okay, now everybody has your notes. If you don't like your notes, come to me after this and I'll change it to whatever you want. If you come to the lesson tomorrow, it means you don't come for the notes, you come to try and become another person, and every day become another person again. Uh, the beauty of that was that after the first year, uh, it grew, the number grew to become like 600, and uh, we had, you know, uh, the celebration of the end of the first year, and I went up to a guy that I used to see in class, and he never opened his mouth. And I asked him, well, how did you find it? He said, mm, very interesting, it was fantastic. And I said, what was it that we were doing the whole year? He said, well, it was a kind of uh, yoga, wasn't it? And so, um, as you say, uh, he became very proficient in yoga, but not, a very, not very much of an auto-suggestive thinker. Um, I don't know that we can teach that. We can try to destroy uh, the the feeling that by learning we accumulate knowledge. We don't. We accumulate facts, uh, which brings me to a point, and then I'm going to ask for an intermezzo. It brings me to a point. Uh, I find the Bible to be a beautiful book, beautifully written, and everything. Uh, especially the beginning. In the beginning, there was nothing. Bereshit, there was nothing. Genesis, you know, the Christian Bible says that in the beginning there was a word, but the Hebrew Bible says in the beginning there was nothing. And the more I read, you know, uh, 
Dawkins and try to think myself into it, it's like getting to the place of entropy, getting to the place of chaos, getting to the place where nothing is really there. It's, and then out of this, something comes out. And if we want to know exactly what comes out, we are playing the wrong game. Uh, at this point, I would like to all of us to sit back. Please get your seat belt tightened. We're going to take off all the Lake Tahoe and uh, a couple of uh, guys are going to show us something. Yeah, Danny, you want to say something? Yeah, this is, uh, what you're going to see is uh, we have a rock band that uh, plays in uh, environmental engineering conferences, and uh, all the guys that uh, you're going to see playing with me, uh, that was in a beautiful uh, location in Lake Tahoe, as you can see, uh, are uh, professors of uh, biomedical engineering. And, uh, this is part of the thing that uh, after uh, reading, uh, when I just started in the field, and I thought that I came from uh, for a while, I was a professional musician. I produced a record that was a music critic uh, back in Israel. And uh, then I uh, uh, went back into academia and uh, started uh, my academic career. So I thought that, that all the other guys that um, are completed their PhDs and uh, with me are kind of nerds and uh, that I will have a huge difficulty relating to them. But uh, sitting uh, through uh, the five, I found out uh, many people, uh, not many, but uh, quite a few like me, but uh, came with a uh, certain background, either music or other things that uh, they did in their life. And, uh, we all share this uh, love of uh, music. Now, we do play in this band uh, the kind of, uh, I would say, a common denominator, which is a classic rock. Because uh, personally, uh, music that I write myself or play to myself is to uh, be a bit uh, different. But anyways, we are enjoying uh, ourselves uh, to death uh, during these uh, performances. And also, we have a captive audience, which is a great uh, conference audience. So maybe let's uh, go ahead and uh, make some noise. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody, please uh, mute your microphones while we're listening to this, because otherwise uh, we'll listen to a lot of noise. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to land now in Lake Tahoe, and the sounds you hear around you are going to stay with you for a long, long time. The, uh, the the piece you sent me for whatever reason <laughs> was cut in the middle, so uh, I was trying to download it from uh, YouTube, but uh, for whatever reason it 
uh, I couldn't play it. So I played. I, I don't know why the one you sent me was about forty seconds. But anyhow, uh, this was uh, who was the leading guitar was Danny Bluestein. Who else was playing? I'm, I'm muted now, and uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, No, no, we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay, now I see you also. It was disappeared. Uh, okay, so uh, we have here uh, the keyboard player is uh, Clive Hand, a professor from uh, Columbia University in Manhattan. Uh, then we have on the days uh, Jimmy Moore, a professor from Texas A&M uh, University in Texas. Uh, the, Rather, was also the singer Alan uh, Eberhard from the uh, University of uh, Alabama. And uh, then we have uh, Joel Berry from uh, Latin uh, University, now moved uh, to another university. And uh, by the way, all of us are going to meet in like three weeks in uh, Macaulay, in uh, Pennsylvania. A very nice uh, resort where we're going to have uh, our regular sound by engineering uh, conference. And we're now looking at the playlist. And actually, my daughter, who's uh, only 11 and a half, is going to sing with the band uh, one song. It's going to be such a feel laugh. Okay. So, Carol, you know where you're going to go. Uh, they're coming down your way. Uh, before we go back to the lesser important issues uh, like life and uh, the reason for life, I would like to offer another piece of the, the things that you sent me. Um, I asked every host, every guest that comes to Utopia uh, to send me things in which he finds himself either in words or in video clips or in music. And he sends me quite a list, and uh, I would like to take one of those and uh, present it to everybody here. It won't be too long, but uh, first time I read this, it was not when you sent it to me, it was quite a while ago. Uh, it was uh, when uh, the Polish poet Szybowska won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Polish not being one of my stronger languages. Uh, actually, I don't have any Polish. Uh, so I, I really, I, the only thing I knew about her was that she was very, very uh, an interesting writer, but I did not know to what extent. I had read a couple of uh, her poems in an anthology, but never to the extent that I was glad to be exposed to after 1996. Tell us a little bit about it. what is Shibroska's to you. By the way, can you read her in the origin? Um, I do have it in front of me because I have the files of my computer, but uh, are you now displaying it uh, through your software? Because I, I don't see it uh, on our uh, kind of uh, conference call uh, monitor here. Uh, Danny, if you go out of the uh, full screen, you'll see it. Okay, I see that. Uh, I invite everybody to go out. I'll see. Go out of the full screen and you'll see the point. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, uh, I know Svetla uh, Suboska uh, uh, poetry for a while, but th this is a kind of a new song that I found that uh, I heard that I liked a lot. And uh, simply, I'm still uh, trying, uh, struggling to figure out uh, everything that she meant. She's pretty. Although she writes in a very simple uh, language, uh, very straight uh, forward, and uh, she always kind of uh, crystallizes uh, the message. Here, 
she deals uh, much more with her own uh, problems or failure, if you may, to try to express uh, or her inability uh, to express her uh, philosophical uh, ideas in terms of uh, poetry and the kind of uh, self mockery, uh, self deprecating kind of way, which uh, uh, I find uh, really dear to my heart. Uh, so um, she uh, basically criticizes uh, herself from a point of view of a uh, reviewer and being uh, or a critic and uh, uh, having uh, been a music critic for like, almost uh, nine years, I can uh, very well identify uh, with that. Uh, but basically, uh, I don't know, would you like to go to the gist of the poem or uh, Maybe let me ask you, what's your interpretation of uh, uh, what you've seen there? Well, first of all, uh, every time I read Shibroska, I am again surprised at how incredibly deep the lady is by sitting down in one little room in a chair in front of a window. Uh, the room is bare. Uh, there's nothing in the room, and everything that happens happens in there, in her head. Uh, I'm not inventing what I'm saying now. This is something that she said in an interview. She says that uh, she always feels that she is not surrounded by reality. She's surrounded by her inner memories. Um, uh, the <laughs> the evaluation of an unwritten poem, which is uh, you know blaming the poem. For not being able to write better poetry is uh, something I think uh, which is close to anybody who tries to be creative in any field at all. It doesn't have to be poetry or music or uh, inventing the new uh, bionic heart. Uh, it's um, and Simbrowska, the, 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 the huge impact that Simbrowska has on me is that she doesn't say it out loud. She just takes me by the hand and leads me to a room, leads me there, and through the road that we did together, I see in that room the images that she wanted me to see, or that I think she wanted me to see. I don't feel, you know, as if everything is closed. No, it's very open. It, uh, I would like to even take the opportunity, uh, you are a captive audience, so you'll allow me the pleasure of reading to you just uh, a part of the evaluation of an unwritten poem. Uh, thank you, Danny, for bringing her into Utopia. She is most welcome to come in person, although she, I know that she's not uh, very well lately and she's not even... Uh, she doesn't like to be uh, in public places, not anymore. Evaluation of an unwritten poem. In the poem's opening words, the authoress asserts that while the earth is small, the sky is excessively large, and in it there are, I quote, two stars for our own good. In her depiction of the sky, one detects a certain helplessness. The authoress is lost in a terrifying expanse. She is startled by the planet of lifelessness. And within her mind, which can only be called imprecise, a question soon arises. Whether we are in the end alone under the sun, all suns that are ever alone, that ever shone? In spite of all the laws of probability and today universally accepted assumptions in the face of the irrefutable evidence that may fall into human hands any day now, that's poetry for you. Meanwhile, our Lady Bard returns to Earth, a planet, so she claims, which makes its Sound without eyewitnesses. 
the only science fiction that our cosmos can afford. The despair of Pascal, 1623 to 1622, note mine. Danny, thank you. This is the famous Monsieur Pascal with his questions. Is the author of implied unrivaled on any, say, Andromeda or Cassiopeia? Uh, Solitary existence exacerbates our sense of obligation and raises the inevitable question how are we to live, etc. And since we can't avoid the void, oh my God, man calls out to himself, Have mercy on me, I beseech thee, show me the way. The authoress is distressed by the thought of life squandered so freely as if our supplies were abundant. She is likewise worried by wars, which are, in her perverse opinion, always lost on both sides, and by the sorry torture of some people by others. Her moralistic intentions glimmer throughout the poem. They might shine brighter beneath a less naive pen, not under this one, alas, a fundamentally unpersuasive thesis that we may well be alone under the sun, all suns that ever shone, combined with a lack of the sky, a style, a mixture of lofty rhetoric and ordinary speech, causes the question who might this piece convince the answer can only be no one. Why did you send this to me, Danny? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, well, it's almost uh, self-contradictory. Uh, uh, philosophically, I, at that time, we started now, but uh, you've read it. I had uh, yet another opportunity, another iteration uh, of uh, that in deeper and understanding uh, more what she means here. She uh, reached certain uh, conclusions and uh, would like to express them uh, uh, as a poet, uh, and uh, she basically, besides the uh, self uh, mockery of uh, I like the style, I cannot really express myself, uh, I'm not that articulate, uh, which of course uh, is uh, just a self mockery. Uh, she said that it's not uh, necessarily the role of the poet uh, to try to convince other people, it's uh, maybe to try to share her experience of our existence. And this is a very existential poem, um, and she, she reaches, uh, reaches the conclusion that uh, we have a solitary existence, which uh, I may share or not, uh, but we, even uh, metaphorically, we definitely have a solitary uh, existence. Because suppose that there uh, are uh, other uh, kind of uh, intelligent uh, life out there in the universe, but uh, most chances, even if there are billions and billions of uh, such other intelligent uh, creatures, is that because the way the universe is, the vastness and uh, also its uh, time dimension, will most likely keep us uh, uh, compartmentalized. Uh, so, definitely in our lifetime, and uh, maybe even uh, never, we'll have a chance to encounter, to do the ET encounter that uh, we'd like to see in the movies. So, whether we like it or not, we're going to die alone, if you may. And of course, that immediately raises uh, in her uh, the notion of okay, so now we have also uh, more obligation not to kill each other, being uh, that lonely. So uh, do we in the back of that? Uh, hardly not. And of course, uh, all this uh, represents a uh, kind of uh, point of view, but 
most uh, people and it goes back to the issue of uh, religion uh, or not, uh, the living or not, uh, would not accept her point of view or will find her point of view of solitary existence in the universe too austere uh, to accept. So uh, the critic, but, uh, of course it's uh, herself that uh, writes uh, this review of this uh, song, points to the failure. Oh, uh, she's not convincing anyone. But of course she doesn't mean to convince anyone. She just wants to express her own existential uh, kind of uh, feeling. For me, it uh, speaks uh, a lot, and uh, maybe this is uh, the reason uh, I sent it to you. Now, uh, by the way, if we look at uh, another much, much uh, simpler and shorter uh, uh, song by her, that, uh, I think I sent you also, this is a word on uh, statistics, but uh, if you uh, uh, look at them uh, in conjunction, you can see that uh, where she's come from. It's uh, basically four short uh, lines. Uh, out of every hundred people, more than 100 out of 100, a figure that has never varied yet. It's uh, very definitive. So here, it's not even uh, that she's uh, trying to do this self uh, mockery practice of uh, I'm not convinced. And here, she's fully convinced. Okay, look at the, the statistics that accept the fact that uh, your model and stop whining about it, basically. Dan, <laughs> uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, there is a reason why you cannot hear me, <clears throat> because I didn't unmute myself, but I now do. Uh, the reason I... I mute myself all the time is that we really have a kind of a thin, echoish uh, sound coming from uh, from you. I don't know why. It's, uh, it's kind of, well, but anyhow, it is what it is. Uh, thank you very much. It was enough of my personality. I think it goes much deeper than that. It's not only your personality. It's your role. It's what you are here to do is to cause people to try and listen closer and closer in order to get the deeper meaning of what you have to say and the deeper meaning of your silences. Was that something that is speaking to you, Danny? Maybe? <laughs> well, I rather adopt the uh, uh, attitude of separate uh, deprecation. So I, I cannot uh, really take myself too seriously. I, I take myself too seriously enough in my research and stuff like that. But now we are more friends, and uh, I rather be the joker. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, main attributes of uh, the human being is, I think, uh, to the little of my knowledge, we are the only being in this universe who have a sense of humor. Um, and it's, uh, I'm very grateful for that to whoever made it up for us. Uh, and by the way, Shimbroska is one of those people that can bring me to tears and to laughter. I, I, I can read the poetry and actually laugh out loud sometimes and then just hide myself and cry. So she's uh, a little bit between uh, Messian and uh, Schubert, if we go to music. And this brings us to something else you sent me. You sent me the quartet for the end of time of uh, Mr. Messian. Is there any lesson <laughs> that uh, First of all, uh, I wanted to mention, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Olivier Messian uh, when he was alive, when I was a music critic and uh, was a performance of uh, one of his pieces in the Tel Aviv Museum. And he was already in his 90s. He died uh, shortly after, so I was uh, sitting there. I didn't uh, uh, speak uh, with him, uh, just a uh, kind of an introduction. But uh, Messian, for me, is one of the greatest uh, composers of the uh, second half of the 20th uh, century, uh, and this, and, uh, 
it's interesting because Musiam was an extremely religious person, and uh, this uh, piece uh, is a very Christian with deep religious uh, meaning. But for me, uh, and uh, this is uh, what, uh, what always uh, happens with, with any type of uh, art uh, creation. Uh, of course, uh, it doesn't belong to the creator, but the audience appreciates it. For me, I, I, I don't uh, find necessarily the religious uh, value that he put into it, but I find in, in this piece that other people may uh, find is kind of uh, related to what we just uh, discussed about uh, Chimborsian's uh, poem. This solitary feeling, uh, this kind of uh, solitude that I found in this piece, but it's not the type of uh, something that we should uh, be afraid of, but uh, rather embrace it. And I think that he put it musically in an amazing way. By the way, he described this uh, specific piece, uh, this part in the, uh, at, uh, at the end of time, as a kind of combination of the blue and the orange. Now, if you think about it, uh, maybe uh, psychedelic type of images of the 60s, maybe the uh, last uh, part of uh, Stan Kubrick's uh, 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, where you have the eye of the astronaut, uh, Berman, doing this crazy trip where it's uh, trapped by an uh, ivory uh, intelligence uh, uh, being there. So this, uh, this piece, uh, Translates uh, for me, uh, maybe it should have been uh, used in the soundtrack now that I'm thinking about it. You know, uh, trying to relate things that uh, seem to be unrelated. But, anyways, I, I simply uh, love this uh, piece of music. I sent you also another uh, piece of music because I think that somehow they talk to each other, but I don't know if we have time to uh, play that one. But, uh, and, uh, simply like to share this uh, beautiful piece by Olivier Messiaen. Okay. Uh, he happens to be one of my many prepared old <laughs> composers. Uh, although I must admit that for me to ever come up and say, I think he's one of the best, is, I find myself always very, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm confused when I have to say he's the best of something because, you know, as soon as I say it, I think, hmm, but. <laughs> and as soon as you said this about Messian, all. I, I don't recognize the best. This is one of the pieces that we like the most, but there are other pieces uh, from totally different eclectic and uh, uh, music directions that uh, I also love. So it's not that the. Uh, it's simply. Uh, out there, it is uh, one of the best, and it's not that I like everything that uh, Messian did. It is uh, also very difficult uh, listening in most of the cases. No, of course. Uh, so anyhow, again, thank you for bringing uh, the end of the world to us. It's a, uh, you call it a difficult piece. I think if we just sit back, relax, and let the music do to us whatever the music can do to us, and it'll do to each and every one of us something completely different, I can promise you, unless we think we know what he wants to say. And if we think we know what Messiaen wants to say in the piece of music, we will lose all the fun. Because every work of art is a work of art only if it allows with completely different interpretations. So let's listen to Olivier Messiaen from the quartet, The End of All Time.
the for the end of time by Olivia Gatien. By the way, Danny, who are the performers in this uh, presentation? Uh, I have to look at the CD in order to figure out. Uh, I can't remember on the top of my head <coughs> right now. Yeah, of course, uh, this is only the jazz on piano part because uh, there are other instruments. But uh, I may send it to you, maybe if you post it uh, so you have the information. Yes, that will be very good. I, uh, I have quite a few renditions of this. I have one uh, very interesting with uh, Emmanuel Ax on the piano and uh, Yo-Yo Ma on the viola, not on the... Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why, but... Uh, and um, uh, I can't remember who was on the violin, but on the... Uh, on the cello, there was this uh, American of Armenian uh, descent. What's his name? Fantastic. Uh, anyway, it will come to me. Uh, which is quite. Uh, I just wanted to mention one thing uh, while listening to Mikian again and again and again. Um, in the early modern music, so to speak, and I'm going back to the Baroque uh, or the post. Uh, Renaissance, we always heard the leading existence, the leading uh, being of the basso uh, continuo. No? There, there was always something uh, kind of keeping everything together. And uh, in the Baroque, everything else was really very much open to the performer. Uh, the performer was invited to improvise. In modern music, and uh, I think that Olivier Messiaen is quite a, an outstanding uh, example in this piece. In modern music, very much we hear again and again our own rhythm as the basso continuo. Uh, here we hear our heart as the basso continuo. The uh, the constant heartbeat that becomes sometimes stronger and stronger and then almost disappears and then comes back again and is softer. Uh, and like the Basso Continuo, it actually opens up the fields for improvisation. But it's us who improvise here because the notes, actually each and every note in this piece, uh, the piano invites us to take a trip, to take a, a really an open field uh, with each and every note because of this constant uh, thing that makes us feel good. It's not going away. But of course, at the end, we feel, well, maybe it's the end of time. So it's, uh, uh, I like Messian very much. He, he was a master. Um, Somebody who does not allow us this kind of uh, pleasure, this kind of uh, luxury, is Shostakovich. Shostakovich <laughs> goes with a drill all the way into your heart, and once he's in there and you start screaming, he drills a little bit deeper, and then he takes it out and allows you to smile and to laugh and to have fun. Because uh, Messian is really, as you said, uh, he's very religious, uh, he has a bitter message to say. I'm very much in the world of doubt, <laughs> you know, in the world of uh, humble, not knowing, humble quest, continuous quest. And I, this is why I found myself so close to <laughs> every word I read about you and uh, even stronger with the stuff that you sent me. How does a scientist live? Without. Well, uh, one of the advances uh, that uh, I've accepted years ago after struggling with it a lot is what's Karl Popper's uh, definition of uh, what is science. Science is something that is refutable. 
which is uh, completely paradoxical. And you, we have to live uh, with this uh, paradox. And uh, this is exactly why you always need to doubt, because you cannot accept anything in uh, science as the absolute truth, uh, unlike a religion. You have to doubt it. You have to question it. Uh, it may be true that sometimes uh, great minds uh, think alike, but mostly great minds do not think alike. You have to look at the great mind and doubt it, struggle with it. Otherwise, you probably didn't get the point. That's what Niels Bohr said about the quantum mechanics. If you accept it, you probably didn't understand it, because it, should, it takes uh, the capital within your feet. You're basically falling down, three parts. But accepting it, accepting uh, the fact that uh, our existence uh, may be random, uh, uh, accepting our mortality, it's all part of the same spectrum, uh, life and science, and uh, uh, living with uh, doubt is uh, the healthier and the most uh, natural way uh, to me. It's not necessarily what dictates my uh, daily research activities as a scientist. I have to report to funding agencies and whatnot and write papers and convince other people. But I am uh, also cast, uh, always casting doubt about myself, about the work of others. It's uh, part of uh, what we do, and uh, I'm proud of uh, doubting myself. You should doubt what I'm saying here. <laughs> Complete rubbish. <laughs> I don't doubt what you're saying. Uh, I doubt that in five minutes, you will not doubt what you yourself have said five minutes ago. Uh, this is the kind of doubt I allow myself to do. I'd like to uh, tell everybody a little story. It happens to be a true story, and you can believe it or not. Um, Wednesday, this Wednesday, I had a telephone call, a conversation with Fabio Biondi, just for whoever does not know who Fabio Biondi is, he's probably the leading interpreter of the Valdi uh, in the uh, rehabilitation of the Baroque style that we are living for the last 50 years or something. Fabio Biondi with Europa Galante, in my book, is really uh, actually a mistake of history. He is the Valdi. Vivaldi died and uh, came back as uh, Fabio Grundy. Uh, anyhow, Fabio Grundy spent uh, four days or five days in Greece and uh, had a difficult time because it was the first time that he worked with the orchestra there. And um, <laughs> once he got the pleasure of working with somebody new, you know, new orchestra and everything else, he wanted to go out and have a lovely dinner, and uh, the Greek cuisine did not agree with him too much. So he, uh, he sat there in a corner and he was trying to regain and not be uh, in, open to the public. And one of the girls in the orchestra came over to him and said, and of course, Fabio, who is a, an incredible seducer, <laughs> uh, tells me, and you know this girl, Dan, she was very, very uh, bright and open and very, very intelligent. And she asked me, Maestro Biondi, how is it? You are so famous. You've made more than 65 uh, CDs. Everybody talks about you, that you're so fantastic. How does it feel to know that everything you do is good? And Fabi tells me, Dan, you don't know the anxiety that I felt at those words. And I came to him and I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, like this. Every day I wake up in the morning and I tell myself, I'm sure that all the strings that I used until today were all wrong. And knowing Fabio, you know that he, <laughs> this is actually what he thinks. You know, he wakes up in the morning and says, hmm, uh, gut strings? Why gut strings? I mean, gut strings change all the time. Why not? Uh, and, but obviously, it's not about the strings, it's about the doubting. And I think that, you know, modesty is one of those words that we uh, use with a certain 
snub of our nose because uh, why be modest if you have nothing to be proud about or vice versa? Uh, so instead of talking about modesty, I really uh, much rather drop the very the very essence of human being, uh, the questioning, the continuous question, a question that don't want answers, questions that want to open gates for even more questions. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Danny, what is uh, the next question you're going to try to tackle? Well, um, uh, quite a few things in my mind. But this is very kind of uh, almost uh, uh, technical, uh, but the only thing that uh, you guys may relate to is that it all uh, belongs to uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, I'm a working project, for example, on the better diagnostics. Uh, for all kinds of cardiovascular uh, diseases, uh, aneurysms and uh, bundled blocks and coronary arteries, based on uh, kind of uh, sophisticated uh, patient based uh, imaging and uh, modeling. So, this is uh, one thing that uh, eventually may benefit our health. Uh, this is why I alluded to that uh, my research is uh, kind of uh, uh, self. Uh, in that kind of uh, process, because you know, uh, as uh, much as uh, we accept our mortality, we also try to fight it. This is uh, the fight that uh, we always uh, have with uh, evolution. The machinery breaks down. So uh, that's uh, currently uh, what I'm doing in uh, my research. Uh, so I may benefit uh, from it in the future, other people may benefit, but this is very specific to my research and my research career. In uh, other things, I'm uh, obviously trying to uh, find things that I uh, find that uh, interest. I'm uh, not a bored person because I obviously look for something to intrigue myself and, uh, to get uh, into. So it could be a new poem, a new piece of music. Try to do something myself. Uh, the only problem is the time, but uh, we have all the time as we know, and uh, I accept it. So I won't be able to do anything. I'm trying to do some. No plans. <laughs> uh, this also brings uh, back different thoughts about uh, the meaning of time and what. By the way, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, thinking of, uh, I'm going to mention three of the personas horribilis, uh, Emmanuel Kant, Hegel, and uh, our friend Wittgenstein, what, what is the direction that your thinking goes? So it's the criticism uh, of rationality that uh, our friend Kant was so strong about, uh, the moral core of a Hegel, or the precise in the impossibility of being precise of Mr. Wittgenstein. Where do you find yourself? Okay. Uh, when you doubt, always doubt others. Uh, I I can adopt uh, some uh, of uh, the thinking. I never adopted any, uh, any uh, as you know, Wittgenstein himself uh, contradicted uh, himself uh, later on in his life and uh, kind, of, kind of came up uh, with his own philosophy that uh, counteracted uh, anything that he uh, laid down uh, before. Uh, so, First of all, I do not necessarily accept the use and also Chomsky's uh, argument that the only things that we, we can articulate uh, is uh, something uh, meaningful and uh, uh, something that uh, we can discuss. Yeah, I, 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 and also, that's uh, the criticism of what 
being rational per se. Yeah, just uh, if you, because I earlier mentioned the, the way I at least uh, understand or experience my thinking process, uh, so at least for me, objectively, I uh, don't have any proof, and it's not necessarily my field of expertise, but uh, the way we think is not uh, always uh, or could be broken down by uh, rational thinking or the collapse of uh, causality that uh, I was uh, mentioning, etc. Uh, so, in any of these uh, philosophers, I can uh, certainly find things that uh, say, okay, they uh, probably right, but the uh, other aspects, uh, facets of uh, philosophy is not necessarily something that uh, I accept. And I'm also not that knowledgeable uh, to be any authority in uh, telling that. But uh, I always uh, go about like that, and uh, I'm kind of covering uh, my own way. And uh, in, in that, uh, maybe I'm not as methodical as I'm being in my research, but I enjoy doing it uh, this way. Also, in music, by the way, I'm not uh, very methodical, but I mostly improvise. We'll talk about the improvising. I think the improvisation is something you want. Uh, you would have had a difficult time with uh, our friend Wittgenstein. There's a terrible story about Wittgenstein, and this story happens to be true. Uh, in one of his various uh, phases in life, he was teaching high school girls aesthetics. <laughs> and whenever one of the girls did not understand or seemed not to understand what he was saying, he would hit them with a the ruler. So this is Mr. <laughs> Wittgenstein, but there was one uh, phrase of uh, Wittgenstein that always stays with me, and it's such a fantastic phrase, I'm going to share it with you. He says, if the lion were to speak our language, we would not be able to understand each other. And I think that's quite, quite a phrase. Let me go to the next uh, Intermezzo Musicale. Uh, we have here the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Tell us what this means to you, Danny. Actually, uh, this is not the people who uh, the Mahavishnu Orchestra. John McLaughlin uh, wrote this uh, piece and uh, led the Mahavishnu Orchestra as another, uh, it might be a very important musician of the, again, uh, uh, the second half of the 20th century, and uh, while he covers all uh, kind of aspects of uh, music, but he comes from uh, jazz and uh, fusion, but he is uh, one, uh, one of the leaders of the uh, fusion between uh, Indian music uh, and world music and uh, jazz and uh, rock in many ways. But this specific uh, piece, which is called Sanctuary, in my opinion, uh, has a lot of uh, resemblance, uh, although you may not uh, recognize it, to the of the MS Young piece. It's a bit uh, more melodic, uh, and part of them, uh, at least uh, at that stage uh, when he wrote it, John McLaughlin, this piece was also in a very religious type of uh, phase. Uh, actually, the Mahavishnu is a title that uh, was bestowed on him by. Religious music, uh, religious artistic narratives, 
whether it's in music or in painting or whatever, is and was very, very important because it gave, it gave the creator a kind of a, an anchor. But the anchor was on a, on a ship, and it was the captain of the ship who decided when to throw the anchor and when to pull it up. Uh, if you compare Arbo Park, uh, who is a very religious composer, if you compare his religious music in different periods of his own life, you know, when he was minimalistic in the beginning, and then he, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's religious. You can find the narrative of uh, of the Virgin and everything else, but it's something where he is the decider, and he takes you to a place where only if you allow your mind and your heart and whatever, I'm not going to go into all the members, uh, to be joined by different sounds, it will do different things to you. If not, it will be like what, you know, uh, music can be in elevators. You can hear the most divine music uh, plastically rendered to you in an elevator going up to the 100th uh, floor in a uh, high-rise in New York, and the music won't mean anything to you. It's just a passing of time. So let's see what Mahavishnu Orchestra has to tell us.
What is it, Danny, in music that moves us? Is it the sound? Is it the rhythm? What is it? Well, first, I think it's extremely individual. Kind of uh, music that uh, may move me, not may move others. I did uh, find this a long time ago, but it was, of course, something very universal. And uh, actually, you know, talking about new ideas in research, I would have loved uh, to research better, uh, but a few researchers who actually do that, more like uh, neuroscientists and brain scientists. From what I've read and heard so far, and being kind of a musician myself, I'm a bit disappointed in kind of approaches. Uh, I think it's a very virgin uh, field, and maybe it should be researched by somebody who has uh, roots in music and uh, then uh, became an academic uh, researcher. I'm not talking about myself, I won't uh, be doing that. But I hope that uh, somebody else uh, will pick up. Uh, what is it? Uh, of course, it's a mystery. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, Wales music, and so uh, maybe other examples uh, in the animal world. But I'm not sure about it. I'm not sure it's uh, the same thing. Maybe it relates to what you were saying about if we could uh, understand what the uh, lions were talking about. You know, it's, it's the same issue. But Certainly, uh, somewhere uh, along the uh, evolution, uh, something in our brains uh, developed in such a way that uh, music, in a way, may be benefiting us. Uh, or maybe it is a kind of an aberration, maybe like Richard Dawkins' uh, ideas about memes, those uh, uh, kind of uh, metal viruses that uh, stick to your brain that, uh, for example, make you believe uh, it's personal or not, you know, some houses that uh, we enjoy. So I don't know, I don't have an explanation. The only thing I know is that uh, music is so important uh, part of uh, my life. And, uh, uh, but uh, it never ceased uh, to be. And uh, by the way, I've seen quite a few people that uh, it's not necessarily the case. This is why I'm saying it's uh, so individual. For me, it's uh, uh, part of my life all the time. For other people, it's uh, something that can do background, uh, that they can sometimes relate to, sometimes not. You know, it's, uh, again, very personal. It's so interesting to hear what you said. Just, uh uh, with a lot of our other uh, guests who are uh, professional musicians and who, you know, for whom music is their life, is their career, is, uh, the way they uh, relate to themselves and through music they relate to others. Um, <laughs> I asked quite a few of them, what kind of music do you like to listen to? And not one of the classical musicians, not one, actually said that he can or likes to listen to classical music because classical music for them, they're all classical musicians. Uh, they are Baroque or uh, classical musicians. Uh, <laughs> and it was strange. To each and every one said almost the same thing. Said, no, classical music is weird. <laughs> you know, uh, we had here a Baroque diva, uh, Sonia Prima, who was listening to uh, Baroque opera, <laughs> and you should see her. She was moving like a rock star, you know. She was going <laughs> with, uh, and then we had uh, Rachel Mercer, who's a very talented uh, cello player. She was a part of the Aviv Quartet, uh, and she said the same thing. She said, uh, When I do something around the house, I always have to have music. But uh, no way am I going to listen to classical music because when I listen to classical music, I think, what am I going? How am I going to play it? How am I going to interpret it? And uh, it's it's not listening to music anymore. So I think if we are not professional musicians, we might have the advantage of being able to listen to whatever music we want without having to think about world. Uh, which is quite nice. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity here to invite everyone to uh, go to our site, and I'm going to share it with you here in just a second.
I'd like you to uh, just, uh, I'll show you something where you can go to read something that Danny was kind enough to send to us. And uh, I think it's, it's uh, very interesting because, uh, well, here you see Danny in his, wearing his other hat. Uh, what he holds in his hand might save lives, although it looks terrible. But uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, it's a piece of salt eternalized in, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, Is that another way of trying to use the office? Big one. Just a second. I couldn't understand what you said. Yeah, and now it's better. Uh, I've tried to open uh, this uh, word doc uh, from the website, and uh, did, uh, I think it uh, may get corrupted. I'm not sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for <laughs> bringing it to my mind. I didn't know that it was corrupted. Uh, but uh, Danny sent me. I, I'm going to make sure that the right copy comes back up. Uh, Danny sent me something uh, called the evolution of theism, and uh, starting with a, the eternal message of Mr. Bertrand Russell. By the way, a uh, big friend and then uh, a rival at least in the eyes of Wittgenstein, although uh, Russell was always very, very supportive of Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein came to the idea that Russell was trying to undermine him. Uh, anyhow, uh, the sentence being, most people would rather die than think, uh, kind of opens up a lot of venues for thought. But uh, <laughs> what I wanted to take out of uh, what you sent me. It's just the beginning of uh, Randy Newman's, uh, how should I call it, lyrics, poetry, <laughs> whatever. God's song. Cain slew Abel, Seth knew not why, for if the children of Israel were to multiply, why must any of the children die? So he asked the Lord, and the Lord said, Man means nothing. He means less to me than the uh, lowliest cactus flower or the humblest yucca tree. He chases round the desert because he thinks that's where I'll be. <laughs> that's why I love mankind. Uh, uh, what is it in this that Danny Bluestein finds himself? Uh, first of all, I, I love the, the cynical humor of uh, Randy Newman. He's a very clever guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes uh, when I get into uh, philosophical discussion about uh, being an atheist, uh, I've been accused in the past of being immoral. And uh, in a way, uh, I'm uh, considering myself a pretty moral uh, person. But uh, uh, usually atheists are uh, accused of that because uh, the sense is that moral is an absolute value. And the question is, uh, can you accept something uh, or morality that uh, is not necessarily absolute? And uh, also morality in sense that is embedded in us uh, during the evolution uh, because it benefited us and uh, in that uh, also it's a kind of a free choice in a way to be moral or immoral, which uh, in my opinion uh, puts you on a higher uh, uh, kind of a place than uh, morality that is dictated to you. But uh, anyways, uh, what Randy Newman uh, I think uh, was trying to articulate in this song is look at the 
about, but uh, you believe it. Um, uh, this uh, benevolent uh, kind of creature uh, uh, that uh, takes uh, care of us. And uh, maybe you should uh, doubt it. No, we were discussing uh, doubting. So uh, this is uh, actually kind of recipe for people to doubt uh, belief in God. And uh, basically, uh, if you read through it, which is of course a very cynical uh, text of that, uh, basically uh, it's set out to show that God is immoral. Well, uh, I think uh, sometimes I sit back and I just think, how can we be so stupid and hate disasters, catastrophes, tsunamis, war? If it weren't for war and tsunamis and natural disasters and death, there would be no food for us. There would be not enough oxygen for all of us. The only reason why we are here alive is, yes, because of some funny, freaky gene was stronger than another, but above all, a lot of genes lost the battle and left place for somebody else. And we are that somebody else. As you say, completely randomly, the choice is <laughs> we, we are not to... Uh, take any merit in the choice because we had nothing to do with it. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, my feeling about uh, morality. You know, uh, morality is what? It's, uh, you know, beauty is uh, truth. Uh, if you read most of the ancients, beauty was truth. Uh, is it? Can we relate to it, really? I'd like to go back to the uh, article you sent me, the evolution, and uh, I would like to read a couple of... Uh, in that article, you also... Uh, let me uh, share this with you just a second. Okay. Can you all see it now? No, you can't. Can you see the poem of Yud Amichai, everybody? Yeah, okay. It's called God Full of Mercy, written by Yud Amichai, who is a very, very talented and uh, to my taste, uh, quite unique poet, uh, in a way, very much in the way of uh, Shimbroska, using a very simple and day-to-day -day, uh, language. That's why it's very easy, so to speak, to translate into different languages. God full of mercy. God full of mercy, the prayer for the dead. If God was not Full of mercy, mercy would have been in the world, not just in him. I, who plucked flowers in the hills and looked down into all the valleys, I, who brought corpses down from the hills, can tell you that the world is empty of mercy. I, who was king of swords at the seashore, who stood without a decision at my window, who counted the steps of angels, whose heart Lifted weights of anguish. I, in the horrible compass, I who use only a small part of the words in the dictionary, I who must decipher riddles, I don't want to decipher. No, this is not for the God full of mercy. There would be mercy in the world. Not just in him. Are uh, these words of a non believer or of a hyper believer, Danny? Well, uh, I, 
never had an opportunity to uh, discuss it with the poet himself, or unfortunately he died uh, several years ago. Uh, and it's always uh, uh, open to debate uh, whether somebody like him uh, was a believer or not. Uh, because in a, in a way, if you even think about Richard Dawkins, that always has an argument to prove that there is uh, no God. While I personally have no interest in uh, proving or disproving the existence of God. It's, uh, it's simply uh, different uh, kind of norma, if you say, non magistrates, but shouldn't be mixed, and I'm not interested in that uh, question. Uh, but certainly, uh, this is, uh, if not an uh, atheist uh, point of view, but uh, maybe I would interpret it uh, that uh, way if it's an agnostic. Uh, now, but uh, it's also more criticism in a, in a way very much similar to Randy Newman's uh, song about the concept of uh, God in uh, religion. Uh, but simply looking at the physics of the description, okay, God is full of mercy. Uh, maybe if we would allow some of the mercy to seep out of him, there uh, would be also some mercy in the world. And uh, Amira is uh, uh, basically telling us that uh, no, I didn't find the uh, uh, mercy out there. Uh, the uh, world is empty of mercy. This is uh, what he says. So uh, this is a kind of uh, accusation against God. If uh, you think about it, uh, to address your question whether this is a believer or non believer song, or this is an active accusation against uh, organized uh, religion and the way God is portrayed in it. So it's open to interpretation. Uh, the, the constant debate that uh, Yehuda Mihai had with the writing, not so much with God. With God, he had a couple of uh, debates, uh, kind of a job debate, you know, the job in the Bible had the same debate, although Job always refused to uh, declaim God as non-existent or, or bad. God was always good for Job, but that's in the Bible. Uh, but uh, Yehuda Michai uh, had a lot of debates with what I would call not so much religion, but the acceptance of religion, the acceptance of God. Uh, there's a very famous, a very strong poem by uh, Yehuda Michai about, uh, against the words of Kohelet, against the words of Ecclesiastes. Where he says, uh, no, man does not have time for everything. Man has to be good and bad at the same time, man has to go to war and make love at the same time, etc., etc. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, very, very strong poetry. Uh, the reason I can find myself uh, many, many times uh, in the poetry of uh, Yudhani Chai is because he is, uh, like what we said earlier, he's a doubter. He's always um, putting first the finger in the wound to make sure that it's a real wound. You know, like the famous Caravaggio uh, painting of uh, the doubting Thomas who puts his finger in the wound of Jesus because he doesn't believe that the wound is real and it bleeds. So, um, is Doubting Thomas a believer? I think whoever had a conversation, whoever had a debate with God, is a, what I would say in Italian, Un Cristiano Mancato. In other words, he's somebody who could have been a believer, but he missed his point. He missed his vocation. And he has a constant war with himself. Why am I not a believer? Uh, I'm a little bit more on your side, Danny, in this. Uh, I find it difficult to go into the question whether God exists or not. 
but I don't even understand the question. I mean, uh, uh, so I would like to share another piece of music with everybody here. Uh, Danny, please tell us what Byzantio means to you. Um, well, now we're going to play uh, my music. Uh, by the way, I have to apologize, but uh, it's uh, recorded uh, pretty low fi and this is this from uh, many years ago. Actually, uh, this is a uh, music piece that I wrote, but uh, in a way, it may have been influenced a bit by uh, John McLaughlin that uh, we heard uh, earlier. I have the types of his music. And, uh, I once uh, played it to, to Professor Hanoko Braun, who's a, a pretty famous uh, musicologist in Israel, and also the music critic, uh, classical music critic of uh, Yediota Hanonot uh, newspaper. And I didn't know, but he told me, oh, you're using the Byzantium scale here in the Nazi. <laughs> so it was a big surprise. So I immediately decided to call the piece Byzantium. So that's all. There's uh, nothing else to it. And, uh, but uh, I cannot uh, tell uh, what exactly uh, uh, if I had any intention besides uh, working uh, with a kind of chord progression, but uh, I liked a lot and then uh, inventing some kind of uh, melodic line around it that uh, ended up to be uh, bizarre. I don't know. I don't know what's the meaning of it. So you mean there's nothing Byzantine in this music? Um, nothing exotic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, please mute your microphones. We're going to listen to a piece of music that Danny wrote. Uh, by the way, did you write it before you started? Uh, uh, as, a, as a scientist? Uh, it was uh, during my uh, PhD, I think. Okay, so this is uh, Danny trying to make up his mind whether to go music way or science way, and at the end, of course, he decided not to decide and go both ways. So let's listen to the dance here.
That was nice. I would know a little bit more about it. Uh, what was this written? Uh, what were you asking? When did you write this? Uh, that was probably somewhere around the, uh, I would say, 86, 87, I'm not even sure. It was years, years ago. And uh, this is a home recording, by the way. And uh, it's uh, not even a final uh, recording of that. Okay. Uh, are you still writing music? Uh, very little. Simply, I have to uh, shamefully admit that I, I don't have time. So, so for example, uh, I'm now practicing a bit my guitar playing for the performance that I have like, in three weeks. Uh, so, and uh, I find that you need to dedicate uh, easily half a day in order to get to uh, writing something, but uh, I still pick up uh, the guitar and things uh, come up in my mind, uh, so I kind of uh, write it down and put it aside, and nothing happens with it, basically. But it's all good. <laughs> There's nothing wrong about it. <laughs> Bless you, Cornelia. Salute. Uh, I hope you are not getting the cold that uh, Fabio Giondi brought back with him from Greece. I don't know, he, he called it a uh, Cold, but I think it was something in the stomach. Danny, uh, this is one of those uh, meetings that uh, seem to be able to go on and on and on. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, be the bad guy and uh, bring this meeting to a pause, not an end, so that we can plan for the next one. Uh, plan in all senses plan uh, with better PR than we have. Maybe we should uh, be able to... Sorry, okay. Uh, maybe we are reencounting here with Messias uh, but uh, to the end of time. We could continue forever, but uh, we definitely should put it uh, into some kind of a conclusion. Well, as I say, uh, instead of conclusion, uh, we will just have the image of an um, old type of uh, record player where the record keeps turning, but the needle is up in the air. And it will just wait for us to put it back down in our next meeting. Uh, and uh, what would you like to share with us? Uh, you also sent me something else, but if, if you sent me, let me see, uh, music, you sent me also uh, some crater. Yeah, uh, you mean something? Sorry, uh, some Oh, uh, okay, now, now it's better. Uh, so uh, you want to play yet another of my pieces? Uh, we could conclude with something uh, uh, nice and smooth, or maybe it's a kind of a type of message uh, and uh, listening, uh, listen to some uh, uh, much more accomplished uh, musicians than myself and conclude with that. What do you say? Well, I spoke, I spoke so much about uh, Fabio Biondi. And <laughs> how about we listen to the summer from uh, Four Seasons by Fabio Biondi? Is that okay? Is that good? Um, yeah, well, that's a uh, fine with okay. Sorry, I'm trying again. Uh, that's a uh, fine with me, but I, I, I am not sure. I did send you a piece by Bill Frizzell. I'm not sure if uh, you. That. Which one is that? Sweet, sweet back? Bill uh, Frizzell. Uh, could you please write it in the chat because I can't understand what, I can't understand what the word. Oh, uh, I'm saying that there was a piece by Bill uh, Frizzell. Uh, it's 
called the Cadillac 1959. Uh, do you have it? Oh, okay. So let's uh, then go for uh, the other piece. I can try and find it uh, very fast. Uh, what's the name of the piece? Uh, it's uh, Bill Swizzell Cadillac. Nine nineteen sixty nine. Can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I muted myself so I could hear you. Uh, could you look at the chat box? I wrote it down, Cadillac 69, is that correct? Uh, in order to look at the chat box, you have to go get out of the full screen, and then you'll see the chat box uh, at the bottom uh, right hand bottom side of your screen. Right bottom. Uh, can't hear you. Uh, second. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. It's a Cadillac 1959. It's a 50s. <laughs> okay, I'll try and see very quickly if I can find it uh, in my strange little thing. Just a second. Nope, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead and let's do your piece. Next time, it's not my piece. It's uh, <laughs> it's uh, just something that uh, I thought might be a pleasant uh, conclusion to the first part of always. Uh, okay, here we go. We'll uh, listen to Summer from uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and this is played by Europa Galante and uh, Fabio Biondi. And uh, Danny, this has been very, very surprising for me. Uh, I hardly knew you. I knew about you from your writings and from the things I read about you. But uh, it was very pleasant to be completely wrong in everything I thought about you. Because <laughs> uh, uh, it's always good to meet people that share your doubts. Much better than to meet people that seem to share your ideas. Because then <laughs> I doubt my ideas, so why would I want anybody else to share them? So, uh, thank you very much. And I thank you, and it was a real pleasure. And uh, I think we should do it again, even if people start speaking about it. Because uh, it's, it's, it's very rare to be able to kind of uh, glide from one uh, reality to another and make sure that you're never actually with your feet deep in the ground, that you're always kind of floating and touching upon things and uh, taking honey from one flower and bringing it over to a completely different uh, being. So uh, let's end this first part of our long relationship with something that is completely from a different period, a different type of music, 
Vivaldi. It's called in the Concerti of Vivaldi. It's number 315, uh, better known as Samba. And again, I would like to ask everybody to please mute yourself, sit back, relax, and start preparing for the next meeting with Danny Bluestone. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, everybody. And uh, let's have a nice summer ending to this evening in the SE Sophia. Okay, so again, thank you very much. Those were fantastic proposals. Uh, I invite you to be with us uh, the next time Fabio is here with us. Uh, Fabio is really an outstanding uh, interpreter of music, uh, another doubter, another <laughs> guy who is never sure about what he does, and that's why he tries doing it better. <laughs> Uh, he's, uh, he's a character. Okay, so again, thank you very much. And uh, I invite everybody to come to the site and read uh, the uh, piece that Danny sent us. I'll make sure that before you come that we actually have a good copy there, not uh, because I saw now that it was corrupted. Uh, that's the joy of uh, living in the world where everything is mechanic and everything works fantastic until you try it, <laughs> you find out that it doesn't, which makes you believe in God, because God made everything perfect, you know, and there are no wars and no illnesses and no pity, because he has all of it in himself. Thank you very much, and good night from Eusophia, where minds meet online.